Welcome to my channel, INTJ Island. Today, I'm going to present a story of mine called An INTJ Look at Civilization, where an Addis professor discusses civilization with his class. Mr. Estois, an abiotic, intelligence-controlled robotic professor, stood before his students on the first day of his civilization class at the Amber Institute of Learning. It was a class blended with juniors and seniors. The girls were seated on his left and the boys on his right. He ran a quick facial recognition check to match the students against the class roster and found that they were all present. For effect, the video panels on the classroom walls showed a scene more than 1,200 years old depicting the men who were working on the original constitution of the newly minted United States of America. Their clothes were strange and they did not appear to have any electronics, but they were hard at work. When he was ready, Mr. Estois tapped his metal finger on the desk to get the student's attention, and he began. Welcome to our opening session, Mr. Estois said, in a resonant baritone voice. I'm sure that Tricia and Thomas have their minds on their upcoming wedding, but that will not be an acceptable excuse for poor work. Understood, sir, Thomas said. He winked at Tricia, and she smiled. The couple had gotten as close as they could to each other by taking seats directly across the aisle. As an overview, Mr. Estois said, a civilization might be viewed as being analogous to a human body. It is composed of interconnected parts, each serving its own function, that contributes to the overall health of the body. Another analogy might be a fractal. This is an overall highly complex shape, but as you zoom in closer, you find that it is composed of smaller shapes, each complete unto itself. Move in closer still, and the process repeats. Civilization, in a sense, is complete unto itself. It creates cities, works of art, produces goods and services, and maintains order. But as you move in closer, you find states, cities, neighborhoods, family houses, and even rooms within the houses. A body is like that too, April said. It has an overall appearance, but as you move in closer, you find organs, tissues, and cells all working together. That is quite correct, Mr. Estois said. Brian, what part of the body would correspond to our society's medical department? Scar tissue, Brian said uncertainly. Yes, Mr. Estois said, but what about broken bones or bacteria and viruses? The immune system and all the associate healing processes, April said. Dr. Weaver takes care of all of that. He delivers a lot of babies, too. The class laughed. Excellent, Mr. Estois said. Of course, the body analogy is not perfect, but it is helpful. The government watches over the entire body of civilization, and that is analogous to certain lower brain functions. However, the government is not the civilization. The body is under the direction of the conscious mind. Irene, what does the conscious mind correspond to in a civilization? The people, Irene said hesitantly. Do the people command the government, Mr. Estois asked. Does the government follow orders directly, like a house robot? That would be disastrous, April said. It would be mob rule. You do not approve of democracy, Mr. Estois asked. Absolutely not, April said. I read that an ancient earthman named Benjamin Franklin described democracy as two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner. The majority would be happy, Mr. Estois said happily. The class laughed. But doesn't the human body answer to only one mind? The majority, if you will? Brian asked. Is that true? Mr. Estois asked the class. Yes, Nicholas said from the back row. So the wolves get to eat the sheep? Brian asked in disgust. No, Nicholas said. Please explain your assertion, Nicholas, Mr. Estois said. The conscious mind of a human body does control that body, Nicholas said. However, it is not omnipotent, and it is not free to act in any way it might choose. There are other forces at work that limit its range of action. If it wants to eat the sheep, it is blocked from that action. Brian, Mr. Estois said, what forces are at work that would stop the majority from acting against those who are not part of its mindset? The Colts, Brian said. The class mumbled its assent. What would they do to stop the majority from acting, Mr. Estois asked. They are the final arbitrators of any major dispute, Nicholas said. Our civilization holds them in high esteem, and the people are willing to defer to their judgment when conflicts arise. 
They also were very powerful, Brian said. Well, that's true as well, Nicholas said. He smiled. Does that make them dictators, Mr. Estoy asked the class? Absolutely, April said. Pun intended. So we all live at the whim of William and Amber Colt, Mr. Estoy asked. No way, Brian said. I can't ever remember having the Colts tell me what to do. My parents have been the ones who were in charge of me as I grew up, not the Colts. It's complicated, April said. It really comes down to their setting hard limits. What limits, April? Mr. Estoy asked. Violence, for one thing, April said. The Colts insist on nonviolent solutions to problems. War would be impossible with them in control. Why do we allow them to rule over us this way? Mr. Estoy asked the class. The Colts have demonstrated their ethical framework, Nicholas said. They have never acted arbitrarily to further their own ends at the expense of others. In every case, when they have acted, it was logical and easy to justify to any fair-minded person. They always act to help the society, not themselves. I think their ability to tap into their superhuman brains is part of it as well, April said. They can switch in as much brain power as they need to fully analyze things before they act, and it takes almost no time at all for them to do it. What if we didn't have the Colts? Mr. Estois asked the class. What could we do? Earth history tells me that we would fail, Nicholas said. Over time, dictatorships tend to last longer. A number of them lasted more than a thousand years. But no democratic system ever did. And even the most harsh communist dictatorships fell in the end. Since they last longer, Mr. Estois said, would a dictatorship be your preferred solution? No, it would not, Nicholas said emphatically. Those systems, though more durable, led to terrible abuses. What else could we do, Mr. Estois asked. We don't want a dictatorship, and a democracy is mob rule, which could be worse. A constitution is another option, April said. This could guide a monarchy or a democratic republic. Brian, Mr. Estois said, how would a constitution help? Since all political systems failed in the end, I'm not sure it would help, Brian said. Nicholas, Mr. Estois said, what is wrong with a constitution? Why would it fail? There are two basic flaws with a constitution, Nicholas said, and that would be true even if it were perfectly written. The first are amendments. By definition, an amendment is a change. If you assume a perfect starting document, any change will make the document worse. Changes will, over time, alter the direction that the Constitution is leading, often undermining the very protections the original document was intended to provide. I am sure you are familiar with what is often referred to as the gold standard of constitutions, Mr. Estoy prompted. The United States Constitution, Nicholas said, and I know where you are going with this, because the first ten amendments are the most famous part of that document. They were called the Bill of Rights. That is correct, Mr. Estoy said. Why does that example not rebut your assertion that amendments are corrosive? The Bill of Rights was in place before the Constitution was ever ratified, Nicholas said. Those ten amendments were effectively part of the original Constitution, primarily as a result of the work by people called Anti-Federalists. Excellent, Mr. Estoy said. Stephen, what is the other inherent flaw in a constitution? I have no idea, Stephen said. The class laughed. Brian, can you help Stephen out and tell us another inherent constitutional flaw? Mr. Estoy asked. Uh, the constitution was poorly written, Brian said hopefully. That would certainly be a flaw, Mr. Estoy said. But we are assuming, perhaps over-optimistically, that we started with a perfectly written document. The application of the Constitution, April said. Exactly, Mr. Estois said. Please expand your point. There has to be a way to shape government actions to fall within the limits set by the Constitution, April said. Someone has to do the checking. At best, you would get a clear and correct interpretation of the original document's intent. But humans seldom give you perfect results. What tends to happen is that this process leads to incorrect interpretations over time. As this goes on, you can get politically driven interpretations of the document that are in direct opposition to the original document's intent. And such errors, whether they are intentional or unintentional, would be applied with the same force as the Constitution itself, with absolutely no checks and balances. 
It would, in effect, bypass the entire intent set by the Constitution, making it null and void. Once changes have occurred, Nicholas said, either by amendment or by incorrect and or biased interpretations of the document, the entire course of a constitutionally controlled civilization would be changed permanently. Historically, this has always led to the civilization falling into chaos, and that led to a dictatorship, either Marxist or fascist. Stephen, why was creating a long-lived free society impossible on Earth? Mr. Estois asked. The boy cringed when he heard his name. Once again, he replied, I don't know. A couple of the girls giggled. Brian, Mr. Estois said, do you know? Or would you like to hazard a guess? Why do we care what happened on Earth? Brian asked. We live on Addis. Who lived on Earth, Brian? Mr. Estois asked. People, Brian said. People like you and the rest of the humans on Addis, Mr. Estois said. So it would be logical to assume that we are studying our own history as well, would it not? I guess so, Brian said. My opinion, April said, is that it is because people are imperfect. There is a majority that are essentially sheep. They are trusting, believing what they are told. They want to fit in with the herd, and they follow along blindly. With good leadership, they end up being hard-working, solid citizens, which is great. But with bad leadership, they are easily led to their own destruction, falling victims to tyrants. If such people are allowed to vote for their own leaders, since they do not think for themselves, they can be easily fooled into voting for power-hungry scoundrels who put up a good image. How is this possible? Mr. Estois said. It is nearly guaranteed to happen sooner or later, Nicholas said. This is demonstrated by the demise of all democratic systems. It's easy to imagine. Who would appear to be the best candidate to people who only look at the surface? The lying, polished con man is easily the best choice for the unthinking masses. He makes promises he has no intention of keeping. He presents a bright, shiny image that looks really good to the people. He also gets massive support from the power-hungry string pullers because he is corrupt and happy to work with these groups. Is there no recourse, no way to stop this, Mr. Estois asked? From what I have read, April said, the sheep reach the point where they get used to being lied to and accept it as normal. They even expect it. When you get to that dysfunctional state of mind, you are doomed. Moving back to our analogy, Mr. Estois said, when a government starts to gain more power and begins to control more and more of the citizens' lives and choices, what condition of the body is analogous to this? Cancer, Nicholas said. When cancer strikes, it is no longer working with the body. It seeks only to reach its own aims and goals. It enhances its own existence, growing more powerful until it kills the body. Brian, Mr. Estois said, what is keeping the cults from acting like a cancer on our Addis society? We are their children for one thing, Brian said. We are all descended from them. Is that the only reason? Mr. Estois asked. No, Nicholas said. Have you spoken with them? In Professor Stacy Kurtzen's class, she has laid out the philosophy of the cults. If you look at our society today, you will see a combination of two things that seem to be mutually exclusive on earth. Freedom and order. How is this possible? Mr. Estois asked. My money is on their android superintelligence, April said. They set rules based on logic that no human mind can fully grasp, but the results speak for themselves. How can we be sure that they won't go bad? Mr. Estois asked. We can't be sure, Nicholas said. But mankind never was sure of its future, was it? Tricia, Mr. Estois said. Do you feel our future on Addis will be a good one? Tricia looked at Thomas and she smiled. Thomas said, Sir, our confidence is very high. This has been an introduction only, Mr. Estois said. In future classes, we will go into a far more detailed look at the many problems that civilizations faced, and we will discuss the solutions of people at the time tried, and we will look at possible solutions they did not try. We will go over various ways that civilizations have formed and their successes and failures over their lifespans. Please read Chapter 1 in your textbook and answer all of the questions at the end of the chapter. Then refine your answers by discussing them with your AI tutor in your own rooms. Make sure you fully understand the correct answers for tomorrow's class. And Stephen, please wait after class. I would like to have a talk with you. 
Stephen looked miserable as he replied, Yes, sir. If you enjoyed the video, please click like. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. If you click on the bell, you will also receive notifications when I put up a new video. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.